blockchain series. Throughout these videos, we'll be creating a version of Rock, Paper, Scissors, where two players can wager on the result of the game. We want the wager to be fair and agreed upon, without a third party in the middle. You might think, what's wrong with the third party? Doesn't the third party make it fair? Well, the third party can be as easily unfair. They could lie and say their friend won rather than the real winner. Why trust the third party when they don't add any real value and you don't have to? That's why this application, Rock, Paper, Scissors with the Wager, makes for a really good application of blockchain technology. We'll start simple and throughout these videos, we'll make the application more fully featured. I encourage you to follow along and copy over each portion of the program as we create it. You can also pause the video to experiment with your program and see how things go. Much of what we'll do here is in a written form as a part of the initial tutorial from the Reach Docs. If you ever get lost or run into an issue with your code, there's also the Discord community where you can ask questions about your blockchain applications and meet other engineers. In the last video, we set up our development environment and got it ready so we could use the Reach programming language, the Reach platform, to create our decentralized app. If you do not have this set up, I highly recommend checking out the previous video where we set up our development environment. So here we have our index.reach file or RSH file. It's in our tutorial folder, which is located on the desktop, inside a reach folder, inside tut. Inside this file, we'll create the main export of our program. When we compile and run our program, this is what reach is gonna look at and execute. We can create that export with export const main. And we'll be exporting a reach program. We'll create that with reach.app, open close parentheses, equal sign arrow, open close parentheses. And we'll put a semicolon at the end. This creates a reach app, and it takes in a function that has zero inputs. That's why we see the open close parentheses without anything in between. This function is run by reach. Anything that's in between the curly braces will get run as a part of our program. Don't worry too much about this code because it's just setting up our app for custom logic. It's kind of like the main function in Java. Now, since we're creating a rock, paper, scissors program, there will be two players. We'll call them Alice and Bob. We can represent these players as participants. To create a participant, We'll use the keyword participant and pass in Alice. We'll also have some logic associated with it, but we'll do that logic later. We'll also create a participant called Bob. Inside the curly braces, we have a to-do statement, or rather, a to-do comment. These start with two slashes and denote little notes to the engineer working on the application. That's you. It allows you to add notes to your code as you write it, and it does not get executed by the Reach platform. Now inside each participant, we'll create an interface that has a defined set of operations. These operations will allow the participant to interact with the program. In our case, it might be accepting a wager for the rock, paper, scissors game. It could also be revealing their choice of rock, paper, or scissors or it could be some other operation we might want the player to be able to do. We'll define what those operations are later, but for now, we'll leave a more specific comment. Specify Alice's interact interface here. This is their participant interface. We'll also need to do the same for Bob. Now we want to reference these participants throughout our program so we can call upon them to do certain operations. In order to reference them, we'll need to store them in some way. We can do this using a constant. We'll store Alice's participant in a constant called Alice. Then we'll store Bob's participant in a constant called Bob. This way, anytime we want to ask the participant Alice or the participant Bob to do something, we can use the Alice and Bob constant names. Once we've set up the participants, we can deploy the reach program and start doing things on the network. Later, we'll proceed with writing the logic of the program. To deploy it, we'll use the deploy function. Later, we'll proceed with writing the logic of the application. That's the rock, paper, scissors functionality. 
So this serves as our backend code for now. Before we continue, let's create some front end code to attach to this backend. This will be in JavaScript. Let's create an index.mjs file. Before we write the JavaScript code, we'll need to load up some imports. These are tools that will help us write our code. One thing we'll need to import is the reach standard library loader. This will be used to load the standard library from Reach. The standard library will allow us to create some test accounts that we can use for rock, paper, scissors. To load in the standard library, we can create a constant and use load stdlib. We're saving it as a constant so we can access the standard library later in our program. We pass in a value called process.env. This just takes any environment variables or settings that we've set up and passes them along to the loader. We'll also import our backend code. The index.main.mjs file will be built by the compiler when we call reach compile. Importing this will allow us to connect the front end to the back end in our program. Now the front end implementation will live in an asynchronous function. This is more of a JavaScript paradigm, but our code will execute within this. We'll start by defining a set of network tokens. The actual tokens depend on the network you're running on. If you're running this program on the Ethereum consensus network, it might be in the form of a way. On the Algorand network, it would be in the form of a micro algo. We can define these tokens by using a function from the reach standard library. That function is called parse currency. We'll start off with just 10 tokens. Then we'll save these tokens and reference them as starting balance. This will be the starting balance for each testing account, Alice and Bob. To create these test accounts, we'll also be using the standard library, except this time we'll use the new test account function. Then we'll pass in the starting balance. This creates a new test account with the starting balance, 10 tokens. We'll create one for Alice, which we'll refer to as ACC Alice. And we'll create one for Bob, ACC Bob, with this same execution code. Now when we create a new test account, this operation is asynchronous. To prevent any operations from happening before these test accounts are created, we can use the keyword await. This will make the program wait until each account has been created before proceeding with the program. It's important to note that these are in fact test accounts. They will only work on the reach provided developer testing network. They don't work on Ethereum or Algorand. You'll have to use an actual account for those. Now we'll use one of the test accounts to deploy the backend to the reach developer network so we can run it. Let's deploy it using Alice's account. We'll access her account and deploy the backend. This will spit out a contract and we can save it in a variable called CTC Alice. It's the contract that Alice created. To include Bob as a participant, we'll attach his account to the backend as well. We'll access Bob's account and attach the backend with ctcalice.getinfo. This will spit out Bob's contract. We'll save it as CTC Bob. Now we're almost done. We just have to implement how one user will interact as Alice and how the other user will interact as Bob from the front end. We can do this by accessing the backend's Alice attribute. Here, we'll pass in Alice's contract and an object. This object will define how the user will interact as Alice from the front end. We won't implement it yet, but we'll add a comment so we remember to implement it later. We'll also do the same for Bob. We'll access the Bob attribute from the back end and pass in Bob's contract. We'll also pass in Bob's interact object. Again, we'll create this later. Now both of these calls are asynchronous, but we'll want to execute them at the same time. We can do this in JavaScript using something called a promise. 
The promise will allow us to run each of these together. Then we can use the await keyword to trigger them. The program will wait until the backends are set up with the interaction objects and contracts before continuing. Now that's our implementation. We import some tools, load in the standard library, and then create and run an asynchronous function. This function sets up a starting balance, creates two accounts, creates two contracts, and then connects the front end with the back end. Let's run our program with the reach command. We can use the extension reach run. And it looks like we have an error, unexpected token. So that's usually a compiler error. And it's in our reach file at line nine, about five spaces in. So we'll go to line nine and it's something with how we're setting up the participants. We have Alice and Bob. It looks like this comma should really be a semicolon. That should solve our issue. Let's run it again. We'll pull this up. Missing reach connector mode environment variable. We need to set this because reach needs to know what blockchain protocol we're going to deploy to. In this case, we're just going to use a devnet. Let's use the Algorand devnet. The devnet is like a private local network. Here it says reach recommends adding this variable to your shells profile settings. Let's run reach configure. Now, since we don't have reach installed globally, we'll copy the path and then use configure. Let's create a new configuration. We'll choose algo as the default network and it's been saved. It also says we're using a bash shell and that most of our environment configurations are stored in the bash profile. Let's run this command so we can actually save the configuration and we're good to go. Let's try rerunning our program. I'm using the up arrow key so we can go to a previous command. You could also click the run button again. With this command, we see that reach compiles our application and we get a little warning because there are no publications in the application. We don't need to worry about that right now because we still need to add an interact interface. We still need to commit things to the blockchain. So this will go away as we continue to develop the app. Scrolling down, we see that we build and launch a Docker container for the application. The Docker container has special configurations and dependencies that will help us run our app. Reach also creates a network and then runs our app. In this case, it's an Algorand devnet. And it looks like we have a warning. One of the tools we're using is deprecated. This means it hasn't been removed yet, but it may be in the future. Reach is actively being developed on, so things will change over time. Let's use the contract function instead, or the contract tool. So instead of deploy, we'll do dot contract. This is also the case for the attach function. Instead of attach, we'll use contract. Let's run it again. Our app doesn't do much yet, but it does do something. We've set up the scaffolding so we can add more logic for rock, paper, scissors. We've also written a program in Reach that generates a smart contract, as well as a backend and a front end. Then we used the Reach platform to test it and deploy it. In the future, you can automate this process with Reach init. You'll end up with the same code we have here. However, walking through it and understanding it is essential to programming in Reach. Thank you again to Algorand and Reach for sponsoring the series. If you have any questions about blockchain development, please join me in the Reach Discord in the Days of Blockchain channel. In the next video, we'll implement the logic of rock, paper, scissors. See you next time and happy coding.